Matthew chapter 6. In this portion of what we refer to as the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus lays forth some physical needs that man has and the concern uh, that we have for these physical needs, the concern with providing those physical needs, the concern of uh, maintaining those physical needs, the concern of uh, making sure that we have enough of those physical needs, things of that nature, and s several different lessons actually can be learned from this uh, listing, if you will, of, of physical needs. And in verse 33, a, a very well-known passage to us all, uh, Jesus concludes that we ought to seek first the kingdom of God as opposed to these physical needs, uh, noted by the word but. Yes, there are all these other needs uh, and they need to be fulfilled and there needs to be appropriate concern for these physical needs. Uh, they are not, uh, uh, they are not uh, things to be laughed at or scorned, but they need to be considered rationally. They need to be considered appropriately. And they need to be considered within, uh, within appropriate limits and within context. And the context here is seek first your priority uh, being seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. We know that the kingdom of God is a reference to the church that Jesus would establish, ultimately leading to the eternal kingdom of God, that being in heaven. But the kingdom of God, uh, Jesus refers to the kingdom of God as his church in Matthew chapter 16, uh, verses 16 through 18. He refers to the church and the kingdom as being one and the same. And so to seek first the kingdom of God is to seek first the church, and it is in Christ's and in Christ's church or in Christ's body where we find salvation. And so the point being made here is make sure you take care of your spiritual needs first. Be more concerned about your spiritual needs than your physical needs. Put those spiritual needs above your physical needs. It makes reference to God's righteousness uh, we know that God is right and everything that comes from God is right, but this reference is to the scheme, if you will, or the plan uh, by which God makes us right. The Bible teaches that we have been given commands and laws, and when we break those commands and laws, we separate ourselves from God. Isaiah 59, verse 1 and verse 2. Sin separates us from God. Sin is a transgression of the law. First, uh, uh, well, it just slipped my mind. I don't know if that ever happened to you before. But sin is a transgression of the law. First Timothy three four, something like that. But sin is that which is against God's will. And by doing that which is against God's will, it separates us from Him. And because of that, God loved us enough to make sure that we had a way to get back to Him, to be reconciled. And that reconciliation process requires us to have a way to be seen as righteous. And that plan of righteousness includes knowing God's will, hearing God's will, believing God's will, repenting of that which separated us from God's will, confessing that there's only uh, one way to be right with God's will, and that's through the Christ, uh, through the messenger, God's Son. For God sent His only begotten Son, John 3, verse 16, to, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish. And to be baptized or immersed in water to have one's past sins washed away, remitted, Acts chapter 2, verse 38 taken away as if they had never occurred. Those are the things that a man ought to be placing his highest concerns on. Spiritual needs. What makes one right in the sight of God? Not what makes one uh, right 
or pleasing in the sight of other men. That's the thing that separates the physical world from the spiritual world. But God never here demeans these physical needs or these physical concerns. He simply tells us that, there, that we need to have an appropriate concern about them, not an, not a, a, an unusual or abusive type of uh, concern about physical needs, and definitely not a concern about them so as we would put them above anything spiritual like God's kingdom. God's kingdom being His church. How we can uh, help promote the church. How we can pr help promote the teaching of the gospel. How we can help promote uh, the edification of the body. Everything we need to be concerned with primarily ought to be in strengthening the church and strengthening the body. And uh, the only way we can do that is by strengthening each link in the chain. And you and I are the links. I have to make sure that I'm doing what I need to do to make sure that the church is as strong as it can possibly be by looking inwardly, like by looking at myself and by strengthening myself. And then, after doing so, being able to be an example and an influence upon others to aid and help them as well. But then he says, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now there are a lot of folks who misunderstand the kingdom of God, the nature of the kingdom of God, what God is talking about when he makes reference to the kingdom of God. And there are those who uh, misunderstand righteousness and God's righteousness and what that entails and what that, that that requires obedience and that requires uh, something on man's part. But then there are also those that misunderstand this idea of having all these things added to us, right? It does show that God sees the need and the, that there's nothing necessarily wrong with these physical needs, doesn't it? that there is an appropriate concern that can be placed on the physical needs. That there are physical needs that need to be met. Otherwise, God wouldn't promise to add those into us if they weren't necessary, if they weren't uh, appropriate. But what does it mean when God says all these things will be... If you simply place God first in your life and you do the right things and you put the church of Christ right in your life at the top of your list and being right with God and obeying God's law in order to be right with Him, all these things shall be added unto you. It obviously would be a misunderstanding of Scripture and not understanding the totality of Scripture and not understanding the life of Jesus Himself to think that everything's going to be just perfect. Right? Because that's not what God promised at all. And if anyone was going to have a, a, the most enjoyable uh, perfect life for being obedient to God the Father, it would have been God the Son. Uh, God the Son, though, is said to have not had a place to lay His head. God the Son is said to have been hated of all men, despised, rejected. Isaiah 53. And so if the Son of God, who followed God's law perfectly, sinlessly, was not going to live a life of ease and luxury, then uh, no doubt God here was not promising that to any other follower, was He? So what does it mean that God would add all these things unto you? And that's what we're going to look at for our short period together th this morning. The idea of, yes, putting our priorities right, making sure that we put our spiritual priorities right, and that the physical priorities are indeed... Uh, uh, there is a place for those, an appropriate place for those. But when God said all these things would be added unto us, if we don't get everything we want or desire, that doesn't mean that God's not adding unto us. It doesn't mean that God's for forfeiting His pro uh, promise, does it? All these things shall be added unto you. Well, in this particular text, God gives us at least one idea of how a lot of these things would be added unto us. And that would be through His general care of the world, through His general providence, you might say. 
In Matthew chapter 6 here, and uh, in verse 28, he says, Why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow was cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, o ye, o ye, little, o ye of little faith? So here, uh, God's general providence is used as an example of how we might have some of these things added into us. God says, look, the, uh, the lilies of the field, they don't go out and worry about tomorrow. They don't work. They don't spin. They don't toil. Uh, they don't labor considering uh, what tomorrow is going to be like. Yet they're clothed today as beautifully as any one of Solomon uh, who may have been the uh, richest man ever to see the earth, right? Physically speaking. And he says, uh, if I'm going to clothe this aspect of creation, if I'm going to make sure that, what the, th that this part of my creation is taken care of, why then would I forsake the greatest of my creation, the creation that I love so much that I sent my son, the creation that uh, I love so much that I made in my own image so that we could talk together, so that we could reason together, right? Isaiah 1 verse 18. So that I could share my love with and you could share your love back with me. You know, the lilies of the field, uh, they can't speak and reason to God. They do show their love for God when they bloom because God told them to bloom and they did, right? <laughs> and uh, when they do what they're supposed to do, that uh, that shows their their love. But you know, that's just how the lilies are, right? That's just what they do by nature. Man has been given a choice. And so we're different. We're different. And so God says uh, that through general providence, all these things or some of these things would be added unto us. In Acts chapter 14 and verse 17, Acts 14 verse 17, It says, Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. The Bible tells us that God sends the rain to the good. He sends the rain to the bad. There are those who have fruitful seasons and those who don't have fruitful seasons. But God has made it so that nature will do what it's supposed to do to make sure we have things that we need here in this life. In Psalm 145, Psalm 145, 9, The Lord is good to all, the psalmist says. His tender mercies are over all His works. So God is good. God is good to all. God sends His sunshine and His rain to uh, take care of the earth. And in so doing, it takes care of the things that we need to take care of ourselves. So some of these things will be added to us simply because of God's promise to take care of what He has made and to provide for the things necessary for the creation that He has made. But we also find that we can have some of these things added to us by asking. Asking is a, a big part of receiving, according to God. In Matthew chapter 6, in the first section, we find this to be the case. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 11, when He uh, is teaching His disciples to pray, He says, Ask, give us this day our daily bread. To ask God is to show that God has the, the power over all of these things. 
It shows that we have humbled ourselves before Him as the Creator, and we being the creation. And it shows our understanding of His providential, general providence. And it shows our desire to seek Him by asking, give us this day our daily bread. In James chapter 4 and verse 2, the Bible says you do, not, you do not receive because you ask amiss. Or you do not ask. In Luke 18 verse 1 through verse 5, God's desire that we ask for things These don't have to always deal with physical things or physical realm. But it shows that God wants us to ask and come to Him, humble ourselves before Him. It's seen in the parable of a persistent individual. There was in a city a judge, chapter 18, verse 2, which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while. But after he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. The idea seems to be here that uh, God appreciates persistence. And he does not in any way associate himself here with an evil judge, does he? But what he's saying is, if an evil judge, a person who does not love God and has no regard for man, because who would have regard for man if he didn't love God? If you don't love God, you're not going to love man. If you don't love God, if you don't respect God, you're not going to respect God's creation. So here's an evil judge, an evil person in authority. He doesn't respect God. He doesn't, therefore, he doesn't respect any others, any man. Yet if this person, <laughs> if this evil miser would give in after a certain portion, then what do you think about the God of all heaven who created you, who loves you, who wants you to succeed? Don't you think that He would provide if, if, if the need was necessary? So continue to ask. The Bible tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Verse 17 beginning. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy that they do good, that they be rich in good works ready to distribute, well, willing to communicate. Uh, communicate there means to be benevolent. To have association through fellowship. laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Now why would I bring this up? Well, the Bible tells us that uh, God may add all these things uh, to us in some form or fashion through those who are rich. Because the charge to them that are rich is to do good. To look to their fellow man. To help their fellow man. To uh, look for opportunities to share the blessings that God has shared with them. They can uh, share the blessings that God has given to them with others. And so God gives richly. And so the Bible teaches those who uh, are rich in this world to give richly. Uh, why? Because they're not to consider the things of this flesh any more highly than uh, those who are poor, right? Right? Matthew chapter 6. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Well, that, that's whether you're rich or poor, right? And if you're rich, and if you're seeking first the kingdom of God, then you're most definitely going to want to look out for those among you in your, uh, in your assemblings uh, to make sure that all the needs that are, that are there are, made, are taken care of. 
In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10, the Bible says to do good unto all men, especially they of the household of faith. So we are taught to want to be benevolent just as God is benevolent. And so if God's people are seeking to add things to others just as God is adding things to others, then, then any need that may, be, uh, that may arise should be taken care of. But God also adds these things to us by giving us the ability to work. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, First Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 11 it is written that you study to be quiet to do your own business and to work with your own hands God has given us the ability to use the blessings that he has provided us the general providence and the physical blessings that we have to earn a living and so how are all these things going to be added unto us it's by using the blessings God has given us to work to take advantage of the physical things that are there, to take advantage of our physical health, to take advantage of our strengths, to take advantage of our strengths physically, our strengths mentally, uh, to do things that are productive and that will be uh, able to raise funds for ourselves and in our homes. And so that is God's charge. God's charge to us is to use our uh, physical abilities and our mental abilities and to work with our own hands. So how are these things going to be added unto us? Well, God has given us the abilities to take care of ourselves and He expects us to do that, doesn't He? You know, <laughs> when, you, uh, when you study history, you see uh, a lot of um, a lot of things that seem to be backwards and um, then you see things and you, you might say well that's, that makes sense right the individuals that um, were rich when they traveled from Spain to Peru or when they traveled from uh, England uh, to, or France to the Bahamas or whatever uh, they didn't come there to work did they they came there and then they wanted other people to work for them they came there looking for riches but they didn't come there to work at times they brought people with them to work right? at times they put the natives to work for them sometimes uh, in, in uh, ways that were not uh, scriptural, right? We see that even in America's history. But that started long, 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 long time before America was ever in existence. But the Bible tells us that if a man doesn't work, neither should he eat. And that's in the next book to the Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10 even when we were with you, this we commanded that if any would not work, neither should he eat. So when someone reads Matthew 6 verse 33 and says, well, all these things will be added unto you. Well, yes, we see God's general providence. He provides things for us. And yes, we see that uh, those who are rich in this world are, are going to be able to help those who are in need. But God very clearly says that uh, our, it's our responsibility to provide for ourselves. Isn't it? That one way that all these things will be added into us is if we use the strengths and abilities and might that God gave us and we use it in the right way and we use it honestly, we're going to take care of all these needs. Why, who would be reading, say, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10? Who would be listening to Paul as he preached? 
I would contend it's someone who is seeking first the kingdom of God. And those individuals who were seeking first the kingdom of God heard Paul say, if you don't work, you won't eat. And then they say, well, that's how all these things are added unto us, right? We hear the Word of God, we put God first, and then we do what God says to do. And then when we work, we glorify God because that's why God put us here. There are spiritual works to be done, and of course physical works as well. Historically, the same goes back to the Romans, you know, in the first century. Uh, the, the rich in Roman society, uh, the free citizens thought that, that they shouldn't be the ones working. It should be some slave should be working and then they should just receive the benefit of it. And of course, uh, that leads to uh, uh, a very harmful economic society, doesn't it? When individuals uh, seek to do no work and add no benefit to an economic system. It was from the very beginning that God's plan was for man to use the blessings, the providence that He has provided with us here in this world and with our own hands make those provisions appropriate. And the more we receive, the more we're blessed, the richer we become, the more we can do towards others, right? And that uh, is uh, seen in the passage we just read, but also in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. And so yes, uh, it is uh, important that uh, we work so that we can help those who are unable to take care of themselves. But I think too here what Paul is saying and what God is saying through Paul is that we don't need to make ourselves a burden on others. If you steal, you're putting a burden on society. You're disobeying God, right? And that's a problem, that's a sin. But you're also hurting people who didn't do anything wrong. You stole from those people. You know, there are a lot of folks today they only want to see it from the emotional standpoint of the person who steals. They say, well, what if he's hungry? What if he's hungry? Well, they need to read Matthew 6, verse 33. And they need to watch this sermon. <laughs> right? But usually what happens is this emotional thing kicks in and says, well, what if they're hungry? Is it all right for them to steal if they're hungry? And they say, you know what? A lot. A lot of people. And of course, most of them, without thinking through it, say, you know what? It was all right for them to steal that one time to feed their family. Uh, I've, I've heard, uh, I forget what the example was, but the idea of, uh, of needing a life-saving drug. And there was only one of that life-saving drug. You know, all these hypotheticals are only one. And uh, would it be all right to steal that to, to save your wife? even if it meant you went to jail. And there will be people who say, you know what, it's all right to steal. Even if it means you're going to jail because you're saving a life. But what about the person who had the drug the first time? What are they now going to do? You stole their only life-giving drug. Was it fair to them? What about what if you're hungry and you steal from someone, what if they're hungry now? They worked with their hands to make a pie or to make a bread or whatever to, to feed themselves and maybe their family and you stole from them and you took care of your need but now the person who actually did the work is hungry. See, you, this verse I think in a lot of ways says don't be a burden on society. We need to take care of ourselves and then we need to help those who are in need so that there's no temptation to steal and to hurt others. And that's 1 Timothy 5 verse 8. I'm having contact problems. I apologize. I... If any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. 
So we're charged to take care of ourselves, to work with our hands, to use the providence of God that He's blessed us with, and to use our strengths and abilities to make something with those things. Not to be a burden upon society, to take care of our families, and then to help those who are not able to help themselves. These are just a few ways that we that God adds unto us all these things. Isn't it? It's not miraculous. It's not all providential. It's all everyone doing what? Seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. You know, if everybody sought God first, sought the kingdom of God first, and sought His righteousness first, and sought to do things God's way, we would have a society that where people were taken care of, everybody was doing his own thing, everybody was taking care of himself, people wouldn't be stealing, neighbor would be helping neighbor, right? God adds to us also through our own giving. In Luke chapter 6, verse 38, Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Jesus says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. <laughs> Good measure, pressed down and shaken together, and running over, shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. You know, it reminds me of uh, Matthew 7 verse 12, what we commonly refer to as the golden rule. And we paraphrase the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Give, and it will be given back to you somehow, some form, right? Give and it will be given unto you. Jesus was a great giver. Jesus gave life. Literally, in the beginning, Jesus gave gives the hope of eternal life. But Jesus was also a recipient, wasn't He? Jesus was a recipient. In Luke chapter 8, verse 2 and verse 3, a certain woman which had been uh, healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils, and Joanna the wife of uh, Chuso, Herod's steward, and Susanna and many others, which ministered unto Him of their substance. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 55. Matthew chapter 27, verse 55. And many women were there beholding afar off, which followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering unto Him. Jesus was a recipient. And... Jesus could have miraculously taken care of every need he ever had, couldn't he? But he saw the need, the benefit of others helping. And he allowed them to help. Right? He allowed them to help. Did he need someone to wash his feet with their hair? No, but he saw how that blessed the woman who did. Give, and it shall be given unto thee. The psalmist in Psalm 37 verse 25 says, Through his young age and through his old age, he had never seen the righteous forsaken. He had never seen the righteous forsaken. Perhaps because he was around people who were seeking first God and God's plan to make righteous. And they were using their hands and what God had blessed them with to take care of themselves and their family. And they were going to God and asking for God when they needed it. And when they saw their fellow man in need who couldn't take care of themselves, they took care of themselves. And when individuals were in need who had the ability, they went to work. And those who were rich gave of their means, right? 
That's how the righteous have these things added unto them. And the reason uh, God set up this system, if you will, of everyone taking care of themselves and their own family, and then as a church family making sure that everyone is taking, is taken care of as well, it allows people not to focus on the physical and to seek first the kingdom of God. It's kind of a circular thing, isn't it? If we're not, if we're not so overwhelmed with the physical needs, we can think on the spiritual needs. And if we're thinking on the spiritual needs, we're not thinking uh, overly uh, concerned about the physical needs. It's easy to see the wisdom of God in that He calls upon us to trust Him, to work with our hands, to do what is right, to be rich towards God and towards our fellow man, in asking when we need help, in being there when others need help, and understanding that all these things are to get to heaven. That we're simply being what God would have us to be. And that's the goal, isn't it? So all these things shall be added unto me. Hopefully uh, this has been a beneficial study. And when we study with individuals who may have misunderstandings about these things, we can, we can help them. And hopefully today it has um, increased our love and trust of God and our faith towards God and our desire to seek Him first because of His righteousness and because of His providential care towards us. He made everything possible physically and spiritually. Spiritually, He gave us a way to be right with Him. And that's through hearing the Gospel, believing it, obeying it, culminating in water baptism where our past sins are washed away. Acts 22, verse 16. If you've not yet had your sins washed away, been added by God to His church, Acts 2, verse 47, then that's your next step in your spiritual walk. But if you've already started that, Christian journey have already been added to the church and have some other need. We're here to assist you in any way that we can as we stand and sing.